Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxon. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Andrew Venezia. So Andrew is a psychedelic trip guide, and this is what we're going to be talking today. Also a poet, a long-term meditator, and a few other things to boot. So Andrew, welcome. Thanks, Mark. Good to be here. What's your journey with the body? Tell us a little bit about how your relationship to the body over the years. Yeah, um, I would say I had been, for most of my life, I'd been a kind of head guy, um, intelligent and interested in um, literature and in, you know, intellectual conversations, these sorts of things. And, um, some of what we're going to be talking about today, when I was about 20, um, I had an experience with, uh, mushrooms actually that started to, to shift that, um, it took about another six years. I'd gotten into yoga pretty, uh, deeply, uh, yoga, Qigong, um, a little bit of Tai Chi as well. I lived in China for a number of years, um, And uh, part of what I was doing there was learning these practices. And eventually it it sort of landed in me that um, my, I'd been using my mind as a defense for most of my life. And actually I'm much more of a body person. And um, as that kind of came online, you know, you mentioned I'm a poet that has always been a very kinesthetic sense for me that it's a, it's almost a dance as much as it is anything else or has to do with the words. It's an integration of the, the symbols that the mind can bring about and the way that the body moves. Um, and, you know, that is also then in the last, so that's like 26 or so, I'm 36 now. Um, following that, learning how to deepen in that, I've done a lot of trauma work um, as well. So somatic experiencing type, type stuff, but also like core energetics, these sorts of things. Um, and, um, as that has gotten deeper and deeper and as I've become more and more comfortable being a, a body and, and uh, um, expressing as the fullness of my body, as my body has become more integrated, that has also um, really helped me open up access to what it is that I'm feeling and, and to the heart and to the world of emotions and, and to subjectivity and to personality, these sorts of things. So really quick and rather vague, perhaps overview, but that's kind of a, maybe gives us a skeleton to work with. Great. And help us place the geography. Like where are you coming from? Where are you, where are you joining us from today? Yeah, well, I'm today I'm in Ghent in Belgium and uh, I've lived here for about seven years. I have a young daughter who is uh, almost six, not quite um, who is, uh, my reason for being here. And, uh, but I've lived, I'm an American originally lived mostly on the East coast for my youth. I went to college on the East coast. Um, and then kind of hopped around from, uh, different places. I lived in India for a while, lived in China, as I mentioned, lived in California for quite some time. Um, did my master's degree there in California working on, um, on uh, intersubjective practices. So things like circling, but also we space practices. That's what I wrote my uh, dissertation on. People may not know what we space practices are. That's kind of like integral uh, jargon. Do you want to just say what that is? Yeah, sure. So if meditation is paying attention to your experience, we space practices essentially are paying attention, uh, paying close attention to what happens in relationship. Um, so the object of the meditation is the relationship itself, which which also brings along a lot of, um, you know, it is an embodiment practice in itself, actually, you need to be very familiar with what is happening in your body and the effects that somebody else is having on you, the impact that they're having on you, um, to be able to find this, this place of, you know, what is authentic for me, what is actually going on when I'm in contact with you, not what I want, not what I think, not what I uh, don't want, but what is actually happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's, let's go to maybe our main topic for today then. So what is a psychedelic trip guide? Yeah. So (laughs) that's a really good question. Um, I guess we'll talk about, we can do each of those words, psychedelic, um, you know, the category of, of call them medicines, call them chemicals, what have you, um, that give you a, (laughs) a very different perspective of what it is to be alive and what is real. So people will know LSD, but also mushrooms are psychedelic. Uh, Ayahuasca is a psychedelic. Ibogaine is a psychedelic. 
Um, MDMA technically is not a psychedelic, but we kind of lump it in because it does, uh, it does have mm, a similar kind of effect in the way that we use it. So that's what a psychedelic is. Um, trip, uh, because when you take one of these, you're going on a journey. You're going on a journey inside your own life and inside your own mind. Um, and that metaphor, and it's funny because you don't, from the outside, you have to say why it seems like that. But once you have, you have done one of these, it's like, oh yeah, that was a trip. And then guide. And what we do is um, help, uh, you know, essentially almost like a coach. Um, we help people through their experience. We give them a sounding board. Um, we talk them through what's happening. We help them understand what it is that's happening. And we kind of hold the space for them to go into their own process, um, giving them the right environment, the right, um, the, the word in the literature is the set and the setting, giving them a, a good set and setting so that their experience is really, um, you know, powerfully transformative for them. So that's what it is to be a psychedelic trip guide. We sit with people while they're taking uh, mushrooms essentially. Okay. And so the set, the setting is pretty obvious. Like it's a nice place, you know, you're not doing this kind of at a fairground or in the, the high street, this is a pleasant environment. And I guess the set is the sort of frame, like yeah. what's, what are we doing here? What is this all about? Yep. And both of these things make quite a big difference to tripping. Don't they? Like it's one thing taking mushrooms and I don't know, going to rave and another thing doing it in a house with your friends or in a forest somewhere uh, and then also the intentionality of it the like okay what are we actually doing here yeah yeah absolutely those are really crucial actually and and one of the you know one of the bad raps that psychedelics get are from trips that happen without any sense of um you know i've started to think of it as hygiene you know it's it's a you're, you're, you're taking a really high octane, powerful chemical into your body, uh, medicine into your body. And you want the circumstances around taking that to be optimal because if they're not, things can get really, um, things can get really, things can go really far off of the rails. Um, but uh, again, the, our purposes, the reason why we do what it is that we do is because it doesn't happen if you're in the right place and if you're in someone who can really meet whatever it is that you're experiencing. And psychedelics are going to open you, or they can open, not always, but they can open you up to um, experiences that are difficult to, uh, let's see, we'll use the embodiment terms for it, but it's, they're difficult to regulate by yourself. And mm -hmm. so if that happens and you're walking in the middle of, you know, lower Manhattan and there's a thousand people around, you might just flip the fuck out, right? You might have a really negative experience. Yep. But if you can touch that fear in a place uh, or, you know, whatever experience it is in a place with someone who is there with you and able to guide you and sort of empathically mirror what's happening for you and help you regulate that experience, then you can bring it back into, you know, who it is that you are. You can bring it back into your body. You can bring it back into yourself without, um, you know, without uh, the sort of crazy making experiences that, that psychedelics have a sort of bad uh, name for. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for people out there listening to this are going to really fall into two groups, those who have tripped and those who haven't. And I think it's really difficult to explain just how different an experience tripping is, yeah. how strong an experience it is. Yeah. I, you know, for me, it was, I'd done, I smoked weed, I'd got drunk. And then someone said, um, I was, I don't think 13, 14. Someone said, Hey, do you want to, you want to do an acid tab? And I was like, yeah, well, that's kind of, that's going to be like smoking weed. Right. And they were like, uh, no, and I'll be like, I'll be fine. And I did it. And I was at a party and it was real fucking different. Yeah. And ev eventually my friends kind of took me home and I, you know, I wasn't able to socialize in a kind of normal way. Right. And, you know, I was reported as having very strange behavior and luckily we were in the countryside and we kind of went for a walk and I had some good friends and they took care of me. And like, I had enough psychological stability that I was kind of like, okay, that was pretty wild. Yeah. And I, you know, I remember I went back home and I tried to go to sleep and there was no way I was sleeping and I was hearing a baby crying through the next door window and it was pretty wild. Yeah. And I did not know what I was getting into. And I suspect had I, um, had a guide or at least some sort of warning about what that experience might've been like, it would have been a much more pleasant experience. Yeah. And it seems like a lot of the psychedelics got a kind of a bad name in the sixties and the seventies because people did them without looking at dosing, without looking at set, yeah. without looking at setting. 
um, and maybe kind of going a bit wild with it. And then there's been this interesting phenomenon where it kind of disappeared or has been underground or less people doing it in the sort of 80s and 90s. And then recently it's just really come back in a big way. Yeah. Like drugs are cool again. What happened? <laughs> like, 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 like I was like, oh, okay. Cause I, I always used to keep it real quiet that I'd done psychedelics and, you know, pretty much on average I'd say once a year with mushrooms for my whole adult life. And this is something I didn't publicly disclose. Right. It was taboo. Yeah. And mm-hmm. now it's fairly normal. Yeah. So let, let, take us through some of that sort of history of what's happened. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the thing about, you know, you can imagine um, Ken Casey, you know, and the and the merry pranksters in the in the 60s in, in the United States driving around in this multicolored bus, just meeting people on the street and handing them LSD. I mean, imagine if like even the concept of LSD wasn't in your mind and you're in the you're in the late 50s, early 60s button down world. Yeah. And somebody gives you, you know, this tab of this tab of, ju- you know, magic juice. Um I think there were, uh, we saw a lot of the positive potentials of psychedelics, but also a lot of the negative potentials of psychedelics during that time. And, you know, people who become uh, evangelists, evangelists for this sort of thing, tend to focus just on the positives and people who uh, think of it as being dangerous tend to focus just on the negatives. So you have this period in the 60s with this massive explosion and um, and these two poles that came out of it of like, you know, just giving everybody acid is going to create love and peace in the world, um, which is terribly naive. And this other side of, hey, this is actually really dangerous. We're losing the ability to, um, you know, have any sort of social control over what it is that's happening. How do you how do you form a society um, if people just want to take acid and go to the woods every day for you know their entire life? Um, and so that sense of clamping down on you know, which I think was done. I, I'm certainly not an advocate for that, but clamping down on um, the avail- the availability of psychedelics, which was something of a reaction to the. Um, you know, we just didn't know what the hell they were and you know, they're coming out of nowhere, basically. Yeah. And there were mental health issues as well. And there, there are absolutely acid absolutely. casualties. You know, mm-hmm. I've got friends absolutely. that just are not quite right. Yeah. And I've, you know, equally, I've had friends that have given up hard drugs after taking hallucinogens. Yeah. You know, I've had friends who have sort of seen, you know, personally, I've had profound realizations that have deeply yeah. affected my whole life and Absolutely. not just on an abstract level on a really concrete level as well, you know, yeah. making decisions that really serve me and really positive things. But I've also seen the mental health issues and the people yeah, like, totally. like, Oh, you should not be doing this man or, or like the frequency, right? Like if yeah. these substances were used in a kind of, um, tribal shamanic session, you might do it a few times in your life. Yep. Yep. And then that's quite different from people who are doing it every weekend. Yeah. Well, you look at, I mean, Richard Alpert, who became um, uh, Baba Ram Das, was part of the studies at Harvard in the 50s with Timothy Leary. And uh, he said, I don't remember exactly where this came from, but something that he wrote, he said, like, you know, we would just be taking massive, 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 massive amounts of acid every single day because it felt like heaven on earth. Mm. Um, but then when it wore off, and it always did, when it wore off, everything was just, you're just in your life again. And so that's what drove his search for, there's got to be a way to kind of sustainably um, experience this. So that 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 sense of, um, you know, the frequency and the dosage, I think the ritual aspect of that is really important as well in the sense that we don't have a, a way of focusing socially of focusing um, the transformative power of these uh, for the benefit of everyone and not just for your own sort of pleasure and your own your own healing awakening journey, which I think is relevant, but not the whole story. Um, but then also, you know, this is why when we, this is why we're careful with them. We, we um, there are counterindications. There are times when you really should not be playing with these things. There are certain conditions that, um, you know, you should not be playing with the, these things. And so we take it careful who it is that we even will have a session with, for example, who it is that we'll, um, we'll say like, yeah, this seems like a good idea for you. Um, or who it is that, you know, because of these things in your history and because of the certain medications that you might be taking, this is probably not a good idea. It's probably not a good thing to get into. So, um, I don't know if you want to get, just go back to, I'd say just in the way of, in the sort of 
and being responsible, a responsible podcaster, as it were. Um, yeah. Before we kind of go into some of the massive benefits that are here, I think saying some of these counterindications is quite important. You know, let someone hear this and go, okay, then I'm just going to go drop a bunch of acid and go for a walk on, in the woods kind of thing. And a part of the guide thing for me that's come in is actually adding this framing responsibility, yeah, absolutely. saying to people, hey, you know, you've had a schizophrenic episode in the last right. six months. Maybe this isn't yeah. good for you right now. And like, maybe you can speak a little bit more to some of the safety stuff. Like, because we're not sure. saying to people listening to this, do not try this at home. But also, I want to be responsible here. Yeah. Um, th- uh, this is not so we have a medical doctor on our team, someone who is a, is a uh, we, we filter question marks through him. So it's actually not um, what my specialty is. But I can say something a little bit more generally, which is, and I think this is where the, the benefits come from too. But psychedelics dissolve a lot of the ways uh, a lot of the boundaries that we use to divide our experience up which is how we orient to what it is that's real so if you've ever had uh if you've ever had a, a psychotic episode in your life if you've had really severe depression or severe anxiety um if you've had basically any any trouble with you know, orienting to what it is actually that is going on around you, they're probably not a good idea. And that might take a little bit more and they might be a great idea, but that would take a little bit. I would be very careful with them. And it would take perhaps more care or an environment that, you know, we're not real. That's not really what it is that we do. We're not set up to go into those, you know, to go into and to answer those questions. Exactly. Um, You know, and with that being said, it's also why we tend to go to. So there's the word psychedelic. Um, which means mind manifesting, but it also means a certain dose of uh, psychedelics. It doesn't apply to MDMA, but for the other psychedelics, particularly mushrooms and acid, um, a psychedelic dose is one where, you know, there's the potential of actually dissolving your ego, of, of entering into an egoless experience of, of, uh, of what's happening. And, you know, that's... Uh, that can be positive in the sense of having, you know, even an experience of what awakened mind would be of, of what Buddha mind would be of what, you know, really deep states of meditation, but it can also lead to derealization to the, the, you know, the underside of a lot of that, the sense that nothing is actually real, that this is all just an illusion and that can be horribly dangerous. So we tend to aim for a different kind of experience when we're guiding people, we aim for what is called a psycholytic experience and a psycholytic experience is one where you're not going to be dissolving your ego um, but you're going to be loosening everything up in a way that you can sort of work with internally in a much much easier way Um, and that you know has a lot of benefits but not the least of which is you can actually integrate what it is that happens in a session like this into the rest of your life Um, you're not just being shot out into space and then coming crashing back down with like, well, how the hell do I work with all of this stuff that just happens? What is it that means? Um, so that's a little, little bit of a word of caution, but. Yeah, I'm going to jump in with a, a word there as well. She said integration. So this, it seems to be talking to Miriam, our mutual friend who does this work too, like a key idea that she's talking about that people have these state experiences. And as you know, you said to the guys in the 60s, who just want to keep having the state but they're not necessarily integrating right. and tray into their life. And I, you know, I, I had these from other things. So I had a sort of mystical opening through right. my first sexual experiences at 16. Yep. And I think it took me about 10 years to really, to integrate that fully. Yeah. Cause I didn't have a context for it. I didn't have a guide. I didn't, and this is, you know, not a psychedelic based experience, but a, a mystical experience just from, from um, losing my yeah. virginity and like lovemaking yeah. with my first partner, yeah. uh, which is another place people can have these kind of no self kind of experiences. Yeah. And I didn't have a context for it. I didn't have a practice to embed it. Yeah. It's kind of like, wh- how do you do the washing up after you've seen the face of God to speak somewhat yes. poetically, yeah. this yeah. integration piece seems really critical to what you guys are doing. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's interesting that you bring up mystical states, too. I mean, this is this is one of my uh, it overlaps with the trip guide, but it's one of my um, I would say, I don't know if passion is the right word, but it's something that animates me for sure is, you know, how do you integrate these things into a normal sense of life? Because it's not about the state. Um, And that's one of the things that a lot of people don't understand. They're looking for the experience, whether through meditation or through psychedelics and 
the experience is important, right? Uh, it, it, it can really leave an imprint on you, but the idea is not to not only to change what it is that you're experiencing in a moment to moment way, but sort of change the way that you're orienting to all experience. Um, and that can be a different or a, a difficult thing to understand. And it's a difficult thing to do for yourself. So our, our, orientation, particularly in guided tripping, but again, something where Miriam and I really um, meet on um, is, uh, you know, we're very careful about um, how we set people up to go into the session in the first place. It's also very important. What is it that you're bringing in? What is your intention? Not that it's going to be met, right? It's not a goal. It's not a linear thing. Often what happens in these experiences is you find what it is that you needed. Um, that you may not have realized uh, you were looking for before, but that you actually do get. But then also in integrating afterwards, um, and this is going to be different for different people. So it really depends on where you are in your life. Um, that could be uh, starting a form of meditation. That could be starting a different, a different kind of embodiment practice. Um, you know, somebody who I was working with just, um, you know, realized in their session like oh the joy of having a body needs to be expressed and that practice became just a practice of dancing and and learning how to um how to move this energy that they now felt that they they felt a connection to in their session how to move that out in their life and how to keep that alive for them um so that's that's also one way of doing it where i would say that you know there's there's a way of integrating for every person yeah. Um, there's a sort of unique way of integrating for every person, but it, it is always going to involve returning to what it, uh, returning to whatever it is that you received or whatever it is that you saw or experienced um, and doing so in an intentional way, in a way that is um, over time and a way that is in your life and not just in this, you know, one Friday morning in the middle of Amsterdam that, you know, stands out, but can't fit in anywhere else. And I think also we bring a, you know, part of that is also community. Part yeah. of that is is being uh, in relationship with other people who have had these experiences and who do help to contextualize them and who do help to, um, you know, point out what you might not be seeing and what might be helpful for you to do and and uh, uh, and these kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, and that community aspect is quite important, isn't it? Because it's it's a fairly different. It's almost like a different type of it. It's like waking, dreaming, you know, sleeping, tripping, yeah. but like just different categories of experience. Yeah. And when people don't have that, it can be quite difficult to relate. And I've, you know, I've also seen people who don't have any framework of spirituality or spiritual practice. Maybe just a guy who went to Amsterdam on a stag party and they were like, yeah, let's get drunk. And I'll no, no let's try mushrooms because you can just buy them in Amsterdam. And they ended up just tripping. And you see these like British guys walking through the streets, <laughs> stumbling through the canal and trying not to fall in the canals, you know. And I, I feel really sort of sorry for them because they're having this major experience, but they don't have any framework for it. Yeah. Or any community around it afterwards. Yeah. yeah, we don't we don't in our culture. And I think that's that's uh that's again one of the um, you know, one of the boundaries, and I think where, where it comes into this, to this conversation, even the, even the boundary of, oh, I'm not just a, my, I'm not just my mind. I'm not just what it is that I think that I am. I'm, I'm actually this, this expression of energy that includes my body and includes my emotions and includes my mind. And to be able to see that directly, but then not to know how to get back to that afterwards can actually be really painful. And yeah. I think that's the, that's that urge to like, well, I'm going to keep taking mushrooms because whenever I take mushrooms, I feel like the real me. It's possible yes. to feel like the real me in your day to day life. And knowing that or having that touchstone of what it feels like to be that full expression of self from from some of these experiences can help you to bring that back into the rest of your life. Um, but, yeah, you do need a you do need someone who can tell you you're not fucking insane. Like you're not a crazy person because you experienced this or this or this or that when you were yeah. having a mystical experience or when you were on, on mushrooms. And like those guys who are, and I, you know, I know those, those uh, bachelor party, you know, bachelor party, br British bachelor party uh, parties walking through Amsterdam too. You know, I pass them all the time. I'm in Amsterdam a lot and there's a lot of them there too. And they don't, they're not going to be able to contextualize that for each other. They're, they're, you know, and if you're the one guy who's having this massive mystical opening while everybody else is 
getting drunker and drunker and, you know, going to going to the red light district. And, you know, it can be a really disorienting and alienating experience. Um, So making it not that is also one of our aims, making it a part of what it is to have a real normal, grounded, you know, practical um, life. That's part of our that's part of our aim. And now you're in Belgium, but you do it in Amsterdam sometimes because the legalities is that they sort of borderline legal there, isn't it, to do what you do? It's legal to do what it is that we do. I mean, we're not we're not procuring anything. We're not offering anything. We're just basically sitting there with people as they're tripping. And um, okay, so as long as you don't buy it for them, they they're, they're buying it themselves. That's legal. Yeah they do it and you're you're there so you're just essentially saying well this is a counseling service this is a psychological service yep. and so it's it's totally legal yep yeah it's not illegal to sit with people while they're doing psychedelics and even you and the netherlands is also very um you know they're very liberal about this they're also um you know if you're a kid and you're at a rave uh you get some mdma and you go to a police officer and he can check it for you so that you know that it's actually mdma and not some <laughs> fucking drug that you don't know you're putting in your body and he wow. gets back to you i mean that's that i mean that's a second that's second hand so i if that doesn't turn out to be the case don't send me a thousand emails but you <laughs> no, know. I, I tried that and now i'm in jail and all yeah, and I got, now i'm in jail thanks <laughs> so <laughs> Fucking deep, deep fucking undercover for the Netherlands police. Force. You know, one time I saw one time I saw the, the Dutch police just being really gentle with some people who were tripping in Amsterdam. I've done a lot of embodied training in Amsterdam, so I've been, you know, yeah. I've been around seen this. And I've never actually tripped there. But uh and, and they were just like being like, Okay, it looks like you're having a rough time, maybe shit down have a drink, here's some water, don't worry, it's gonna be fine. And they were like just really like because people don't if you have tripped, you realize how delicate people's psychological state can be. Yeah. Like if I ever bump into anyone tripping in any environment, I'm just really nice to them. Yeah. I treat them like vulnerable children or yeah. something like that. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? Yep. And, it's, it's, and, and I, to see the police doing that was wild. It was like, wow, this is great. You know, they, yeah. they got it. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no way to, there's no way to fuck somebody's up psychology worse than uh, somebody's psychology worse than, being a tyrannical authority figure that is making them wrong for what it is that they're doing when they're taking a trip. So that, yes, they they have a very liberal, um, they have a very liberal orientation to a lot of these things, especially these, I mean, we're not talking about, you know, we, we we wouldn't be touching like heroin or cocaine or something like that. I mean, those are very different categories of, of narcotic. Um, I don't think of the, the, the things that we work with, I don't think of as being narcotics. They're not, um, you know, especially with the approach that we have, the, the, what we're advocating for, again, is not the, is not the drug. It's the way that in working with, in working with this chemical, um, you know, in a very intentional way, you can, um, you can really loosen up some things in your life that you may not even have had access to without, uh, without the chemical. But even if you did, could have taken, you know, uh, in some, in some cases, years. I mean, I want, this is, you know, this is not a guarantee by any means, but a lot of the sessions that we have, you know, people say like, Hey, I've been in therapy for X number of years yes. and this just, you know, yeah, I have the basis of therapy to sit on, but this, this was like three or four years of therapy in one afternoon. Yeah. Um, and there is some research as well. That's been happening the last 10 years, isn't there? Um, particularly on things like PTSD. Yep. Uh, we had a guy on from Israel who does PTSD work with MDMA, which is yep. ecstasy for people listening who don't know that term um, and uh, addiction work. And it, it's interesting because people might think, well, it's a drug. How can you treat a drug with a drug? And it's, it's, it's like, well, well, these different categories, this one word drugs doesn't quite yeah. summarize. Yeah, not at all. These things shouldn't be in the same category. No, not at all. No, and all, I mean, that's one of the most promising. You have PTSD and, and MDMA, which is, um, which is just the chemical. Ecstasy usually includes a little bit of speed. So we don't, we don't, you, we wouldn't use that. But, um, um, you know, Ibogaine has is, is come up really big and there's a lot of uh, centers actually now in Mexico that are using Ibogaine, which is the... Um, say, I have not come across that experientially and it yeah. seems pretty wild from what I've heard. Could you say a little yeah. bit? Yeah, uh, Ibogaine, is, Ibogaine is like, <laughs> you know, I would never have called any of these medicines before. I always felt like it was kind of an airy-fairy like, thing. Yeah. 
I, I had an experience with Ibogaine and it, and it was like, oh, I get it. Like this is ancient sacred wisdom and this is, this is a medicine. Absolutely. Ibogaine is, is a, um, it's funny. I feel like completely lit up just talking about it. Ibogaine is a, is a refined version of a, um, West African, the root of the bark on the root of a West African shrub. Um, and it's been used for, you know, who God knows how long by, uh, tribes in West Africa, um, as a kind of, um, you know, initiation, uh, initiation medicine. Um, at, and they do it a little bit differently, but the, the, the refined version of it is being used by, um, uh, you know, my, my link to it is someone that I've worked with is, is Mexican or is, is part Mexican. Um, and she uses it with alcoholics and people who are, uh, I think, speed addicts and heroin addicts as well. And, you know, these people have, uh, you know, they're not just like, oh, I'm addicted. They're like the ravages of addiction, right? Yeah. They're, they're deep in their addiction. Yeah. And, um, and what happens, uh, at rates higher than any other treatment, right? I mean, this, and this has been looked at at rates much higher, exponentially higher than any other treatment. It helps people get off of these substances and get off of them for good. So very different effects in your body, uh, very different kind of, uh, of chemical, very different way of interacting with the body. Um, than some of these, you know, some of these other ones that really can destroy people and can destroy lives. Yeah. Yeah. And just because I'm curious, what is that experience like with this West African route? I mean, how does it compare to other things? You know, all of these are even two trips on the same substance can be completely different. Um, so if you don't have a hook for it, it's really hard to talk about it. Evil gain. Yeah. Ibogaine, well, I, I can say a couple things. Ibogaine um, uh, can connect you with your sense of lineage. It's a, it's a masculine energy um, in the way that ayahuasca is a, is a more feminine energy, but it has that, it's called the grandfather. It's a very, um, very, uh, very warm and very loving, but very direct kind of presence. Um, for me, what happened on it, a lot of people get really crazy visuals, travel to the land of the ancestors, whatever that means for you. Um, I did not have that at all. I just had like for, you know, six or seven hours. It, first of all, it knocks you down. Like you cannot move. Yeah. You are so nauseous that any, even like moving your head a little bit, you feel like you want to throw up. So you're down for the count sometimes overnight. And um, what I experienced during that time was like, I, I really love meaning making and exploring, you know, what is going on inter internally. And um, I had like every second, literally like every second uh, realizations about what it was, you know, how I was put together psychologically and different themes in my life and different things like that. Every second having one that like, if it happened in a week, that would be like the highlight of my entire week, you know? So just like rapid, rapid, rapid fire, understanding how, how and who you are. Um, and then there's a, at the at sort of at the end of the process, often what comes is um, a real uh, cathartic emotional release. So I also had um, one like that. Um, but again, you know, it's really different for indivi different individuals and even different people, you know, being administered by different people. So I had yeah, the context and things matter, as you say. It seems to me as well, this, this, this scene has got kind of more extreme so hey about like dmt and this and you know even mushrooms like the difference between sort of british mushrooms that grow wild you know every october on a welsh hillside yeah and the kind of hardcore mexican ones you might get in um you know or peruvian ones or whatever you'd pick up in amsterdam it seems like this scene's got more and more extreme and i have a concern about that uh, and, and like people might be like listening to you going what you, you can't move your head because you'll be sick or you're out for the count for eight hours i mean this sounds quite full-on and yeah, you think well, there's a tendency towards that as people are longing for these deep ecstasis kind of experiences. Yeah. And, you know, again, I think this ties in with a lot of what we're talking about. Like, uh, these are not a joke. And the, that, uh, the impulse to refine it and to make it stronger and to make it more powerful and to make it in a certain sense is, 
Um, you know, I, I, I don't trust that really either. I think it's chasing something. It's trying to get something out of the experience. And my, my most recent experience with the ego gain was actually very directly that I, I had a very mild dose kind of accidentally for a number of reasons that I wouldn't go into. And I could start to see like, oh yeah, I'm trying to get something out of this experience. And the, and what it's telling me right now is I don't need to do that. Actually, I don't need to do that anymore. I've had enough mystical experiences. I've had enough psychedelic experiences. What I'm really being asked to do is take this, what I know to the darkest places in my life, you know, in a day to day way. Um, and I think that is sort of, you know, we're, we're being very careful uh, with, how we're, I guess the word would be marketing. I don't think of it that way, but how we're marketing it, what we're saying about it, all of this other stuff. But there are people who today too are, you know, evangel evangelists. Why can't I, I can't say that word today. That's so funny. <laughs> evangelists. There we go. Evangelists. Yeah. Evangelists. There are people who are evangelists for it or who think like, you know, this chemical, the chemical is the solution to all of the world's problems. And it's not the chemical, it's the way that we relate to the chemical and bring it back into our lives as this fuller and more holistic panoply of different things that are happening today. It's not the solution, right? It's not yes. the simple thing, but it's a really powerful tool. And just like any really powerful tool, you know, if I was just driving through the city with a bulldozer, I would fuck some shit up. But in yeah. the right place, a bulldozer is a really powerful tool to get some um, you know, to get dirt moved around really efficiently. Yeah. And I guess this is why the kind of idea of sort of guides or people who are knowledgeable in these areas is coming out is yeah. as people realize this is a very double-edged sword, you yeah. know, like I've yeah. seen the people that have done too much ayahuasca and are just a bit weird or yeah. you know, unable to function. And I've seen other people that have had these great insights you know, I've, I've bonded with friends through different experiences, like deep, like, like love friendship bonding to last a lifetime. You know, I've had a, a change yes. of direction. Um, it's, it's definitely informed me. And I think there's other ways to have psychedelic experience. You know, I've had visions while fasting on meditation retreats, for example. Yes. Um, let's bring the, the, the body into this a bit then, because this could seem like a, a head trip. You know, like you take a drug and then you've imagined some things that aren't there. That would be yeah, yeah. one perspective on it. Right. So how does the body relate to some of these substances? That's such an interesting way of saying it because the, you know, in, in my mind, what psychedelics do is they break down that line between what is imaginal and what is physical that, that we use basically to construct who it is that we are. I'll unpack that a little bit because there's a lot in that. But, um, you know, I think I mentioned before, one of those lines is the line between the body and the mind. And what happens a lot on psychedelics is, um, is uh, hold on, body in the middle. So what happens a lot in psychedelics is um, it becomes obvious to you that you are this single expression of self, that that includes your body and your mind. You not only ga gain experience to things that your body may be feeling that you're not feeling most of the time, but they also appear to be immediately valid, right? Your body and your body's experiences are valid in a way that we don't uh, really teach in our culture. Uh, other, I mean, people like you do, obviously, but broadly um, and uh, in a way that, uh, you know, is just kind of obvious and presents itself immediately. Part of the pleasurableness of having a body is a lot of these experiences. You know, there, there are not all of these are body are body highs, so to speak, but when they are, it's just wonderful. It's such a wonderful experience to be alive and to be able to express yourself physically. Um, I think part of the trauma healing of this is, is giving people access to that when otherwise their body has actually been a very frightening place and a scary place, particularly for people who may have, uh, you know, had sexual trauma or early sexual trauma. The body is not a happy place. It's not mm -hmm. a place you want to spend your time. And one of the things that psychedelics do is kind of, introduce that just basic sense of pleasure of having a body. MDMA is also one of the ones that, that helps do, does the, uh, do this. If you watch somebody on MDMA, like you want to just touch everything, like yeah, yeah, the yeah. carpet and your face and, you know, the couch that you're in and the music you're listening to, it's all so sensuous and so wonderful. So it really opens up that, that way of being a body that um, is a kind of, holistic experience where people can feel are able to feel themselves um and and my sense is that that allows the body you know again to be kind of in the middle it's like the it's the hub it's the medium of 
how you were experiencing the world and then this other realm of thought or of imagination or of you know this this more um, what you're calling a heady experience ironically most people are having that kind of experience and psychedelics opens that channel up that is your body to allow what it is that is imaginal to find yes. a home here uh, yes on this earth uh, rather than you know out in fucking space or in the in the sort of uh you know what is the like from the neck down most how most people are living sort of from, mm-hmm. or from mm-hmm. the neck up um I, re- I remember i think i was 14 one of my first mushroom trips feeling my body and it felt like a sort of soft welcoming vagina <laughs> and that they might just say i was you know hormonal young pervy boy but it was it was also it was just the sense of like wow the the welcoming quality of the body yes and yeah. also the sexualization of life for someone that was just coming into mid puberty yeah it, like wow this is part sexuality is part of who i am yeah, and totally. this is part of my being and it's part of what makes up the world so it was an insight but it was an insight through the body. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. And then there's other times when there's been this sort of, st- you know, feeling streamings and sensations of what sometimes are called subtle energies, for example. And I, I think this has given me long term a different way of being able to be present to my body and pay attention Absolutely. to my body, yeah. which isn't, which one might get to through years of Qigong actually, or years of yoga. Yeah. But I think by having these, in these, it's almost like a trip is like you're looking ahead to a mindset yeah. or a body set and it gives you a glimpse of something. You go, oh, yeah. that's the direction I'm going in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's Absolutely. where I'm aiming. That, that's, oh, that's possible. That's possible. That's possible to feel one's body as a streaming of yeah. energy. Totally. And then when it happens a little bit in, say, a yoga class and there's the afterglow of a yoga class, it's like, ah, oh, oh, oh yeah. Yeah. And it's like an orientating thing that, that yeah. you've had through that experience, Absolutely. which can orientate a future practice and again, make you feel like you're not crazy and yes, that totally. this is going somewhere, you know, that might be positive. Totally. Totally. Yeah. I think that's very true. And I've exp- and that's how I've experienced it. I'm 36 now. I had my first major psychedelic experience when I was 20. And a lot of the things that happened, you know, in that psychedelic experience are just the way that I live in a day-to-day way. It's the way that I live when I'm with my daughter. It's the way that I live when I'm, you know, cleaning my house and stuff like that. Not some other expanded ecstatic, or it is ecstatic, but it's, <laughs> but it's not like something other than what it is just to be alive and to be here, to be, you know, breathing and to be grateful for, you know, my life and for water and for the sunlight and for all of these things. Yeah. Yeah. And, would you say certain psychedelics are more bodily than others? So, for example, my experience, mushrooms are quite bodily. Like, yeah. would you say that's the case, or would you say it's really yeah. down to the individual? Or uh, all, all, everything is true about it. It's like, yeah, it's down to the individual. It's down to the different, it, you know, precisely what it is that you actually get. But on average, uh, I think mushrooms tend to be earthier. They tend to be more bodily oriented, um, and some mushrooms more than others. Acid is a little bit more mental but if you have you know i've had acid trips where um especially on really low doses it is exactly what you're talking about it's like oh the full flow of my body is just accessible to me in a way that it's just out it's just over the horizon when i'm here in a day-to-day way um and i i think that's what you know going back to this sense of we make meaning so much around the constrictions and the contractions that we have in our body and when we kind of take that cap of judgment or of habitual meaning making off of how we are being a body, how we're experiencing our body, which is, I think, one of the things that psychedelics do, then those places where we're stopped up, where we're not able to flow, start to loosen a little bit. And you drop the sense of needing to make meaning about that during the trip because it's so obviously meaningful in and as a body. And then later you can start to reintegrate that and reorient from that place when you're, you know, day two, day three, day four after having tripped. So yeah, um, but yeah short answer. Yes. Different ones are more bodily, more, more mental, you know, MDMA is very sensual. So in that case, it's a body thing, but it's also very emotional and relational. Um, yeah. 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 Hmm. Are there any that you'd sort of really warn people off and just say, this is, this is too much, you know, this is uh, to be avoided. 
I think I missed the first part of that. Sentence. Are there any substances or situations where, like just I want to I don't want to keep coming back to the responsibility piece here. Yeah, people could be really seduced by some of the stuff we're saying. Oh yeah. But is there any? Is there any of? And they are seductive. You know, there's there's a, a quality of like, wow, this is this feels magical. Yeah. You know. Yes. Is there any particular substances or particular trends you see currently that you'd kind of warm people away from a little bit? Uh, I think people are starting to, I really, I feel very sad about this. Um, I didn't realize that until just now. I, I think people are starting to use ayahuasca in a way that is actually really detrimental. Uh -huh. um, so if you're going to do any of these, um, you know, it ought to feel into like an intuitively right fit. Don't rush into it. Like with Ibogaine, I, re I read about Ibogaine the first time seven years before I did it, knew that I was going to encounter it at some time, but did not feel the need to rush it. So many yep. of these are more powerful when they just happen, when you're in the right place in the right time. And if you feel that intuitive hit of like, oh yeah, this is something that's going to happen now, or this person is a person that I want to work with, yep. trust that, trust that really deeply because it is a, it is a, it is a realm where you can get in over your head really, really quickly. Yeah. Um, do not, you know, if you find yourself turning your entire life towards one of these substances, I would say, look really closely at what it is that you're looking for and what is happening. Yeah. Um, and look for places. I mean, that's, that's part of why it is that we do what it is that we do. Look for places where you are going to have uh a a safe setting to explore some of these things because the amount of you know the amount of energy that these can open you up to and, and when i say energy i mean that not only bodily but kind of metaphorically um is really really high and if you don't have certain circuits mm. in place um you know you can you can burn out from them and i think a lot of people have um so the only trend the, the trend that i see is that is worrying is that is just uh you know, the idea that, um, and this is happening with ayahuasca, I think, but the idea that, um, you know, the, I think the, let's say the more casual that uh, even rituals are being done, the more casually that rituals around this thing that are being done, um, that concerns me, um, regardless of what the substance is. And of course, we're talking about yeah. psychedelics here. There are some things that I would, I have never touched and I wouldn't personally, things like cocaine or heroin, these really refined, more uh, um, processed chemicals are, are not what we're talking about today. Yeah. Sure, sure. Can you go for another 10 minutes? Is that possible? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yep, yep, you're good. I'm, I just feel like there's more here. And can you say a little bit about what you actually do then? So let's say I come to you and I'm like, hey, I'm, um, I feel like I'm at a crossroads in my life and I'm curious and I, you know, kind of, this is always something I've been wanting to explore. Like what happens next if I was to contact you and say that? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. So, um, what, what, um, we just have a conversation with you. That's really the first thing. Um, you know, it's almost like you wouldn't be able to necessarily tell the difference between what it is that we're doing in that, in that kind of a conversation and a regular coaching conversation. Mm -hmm. What's mm -hmm. going on in your life? What are your concerns? What are the things that you're wanting, you know, to do and to explore? How is it that we can help you? Um, and if that feels like a fit for both of us again, so we'll, we'll also give you a sort of a, uh, uh, um, I forget what we call it. It's an intake sheet though, basically. So it is looking for like, what are some of the counter indications um, and are any of them present? Um, and if we have a fit, if we feel like we want to work with you, if you feel like you want to work with the person that, you know, you're talking to, um, then we'll set up a date to meet. Uh, and we usually take, um, it's the better part of a day. We meet in the morning. We take enough time so that there's no rush. There's no need to go and do anything afterwards, right? You don't want to be thinking like, oh, I got to, I'm going to meet someone for dinner at seven o'clock. That's probably not a good thing. To do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, if, if I... <laughs> I'm, I always say to people, you like, if they're like thinking about doing a mushroom gym or something, I'm like, don't, don't book any work for a few days afterwards. Absolutely. Don't yep. have any stuff you need to do right away. No, yeah. We, we recommend taking at least one full day off afterwards to just sit in it and soak it up and think about it. Journal. Some people like journaling, that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, that's a process. There's not too much. And we, we have a way of working uh, within the session that, um, you know, is sort of developing a protocol of how to work with this, but it's hard to say, 
yeah, in this context, it would hard to be say it would be hard to say exactly what that is or precisely. But just that you know, we 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 approach it with a lot of um, a lot of care and also experimentation and cross checking and all of these different things. So you would sit down in an office with someone and say, okay, well, given your the coaching session we had and your needs, then uh, you know, decided that the the probably the best thing for you to do would be two grams of this or whatever. Yeah. And then they take that substance and then you walk them around Vondel Park in Amsterdam or sit in the office. Or, I mean, I'm just trying to picture yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Tend to stay in the office for the whole time. Um, public trips can be awesome, but not for what it is that we're doing. Uh, yep. We try to stay away from being in society because that can be very jarring. Um, try to have people you know, tuned internally, focused internally and sit and sometimes, you know, and again, this depends on who it is. So I just, I had a mushroom trip, um, a little while ago and I, I barely had to say anything. He was, he was, what was happening for the person I was working with was obviously so, um, right without me doing anything about it, that I was just basically sitting there with him for, it was about five hours, um, you know, and I get up sometimes and take a bathroom break or get up and shake my body out and kind of get out of the situation before I go back in. Um, and sometimes it is more somebody really wants to talk to something and, and has that, you know, Miriam and I are also both very experienced um, uh, circlers and, and, mm -hmm. and coaches. And so, you know, sometimes people want to have a little bit more engagement and, mm -hmm. and, and it's helpful to have that kind of a, that kind of a mirroring and that kind of a conversation around what their processes or what it is that they're noting. And that's kind of the, a lot of the power of what it is that we do too, um, yeah. is being able to guide. I mean, that's part of the guiding, being able to guide people through their own inner experience of what it is to be alive and what it is to be alive taking psychedelics today. Yeah. And sometimes just someone being there with you or, you know, I remember one experience I had, someone brought me a cup of tea and I was like deep in quite a dark place. I'd kind of gone down a side alley on the trip and I was, and they brought me a cup of tea and it was like liquid love. Yeah. And I was like, thank you so much. It was like, they kind of rescued me from this yeah. dark side alley I'd gone down just by bringing me that cup of tea or, you know, saying hi to me at a certain point, you know? And, um, yeah, so I, I could see how that would. I think I've done that with other people tripping and sort of doing it for each other, but I could definitely see the benefit of having a kind of professional who sort of knew their way around stuff who was more compass mentors as well, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the idea is we're here to serve you. Uh, so we've taken care of everything, we have taken care of the space. You don't have to worry about us you know, one little iota of your attention should not be placed on that. Um, so that's, that's part of it. It is really a, you know, it's a, it's a, um, it's a really profound act of service in that way. Okay. Tell us a funny tripping story because tripping stories are always the funniest. This is a good place to finish up. Oh man. Okay. Wait a minute. Let me, I want to, I want to choose a big one. Here. Um, a good tripping story. So, uh, so when I was in high school, when I was in high school, not high school, sorry, college. When I was in college, I was, uh, I was tripping by myself. I was on mushrooms and it was Halloween. And, um, <laughs> already a bad idea. Okay. Yeah, this was already I'm year. thinking, okay, dude. <laughs> so so I'm, like, I'm like walking around by myself and I'm on, um, I'm on, uh, mushrooms, as I said, but I'm also listening on like these big headphones to the fragile by, by, uh, nine inch nails. So I'm like really drawn into this and I just get into this, like, I get into this fixation, this fascination of walking into my house and outside of our house, we'd spread blood on the stones there, not real blood, but you know, Halloween blood on the stones and something about the colors and the patterns and i'm just like i'm just sitting there and staring at it and i'm listening to the album and i'm staring at it i'm listening to the album and i'm staring at it and then like i hear laughter and i realize oh my god i'm like first of all just like gape gape jawed open eyed staring at the ground in front of me for maybe the last 10 minutes without moving the entire time. And somebody finally had noticed. And so I looked up and looked to my right and there are these, I knew them, but there are these two girls that I know that are just laughing because they're like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, what in the hell is going on there? So I think that that sense of, and then the humor in that for me is like, I have no idea how long this has been. I think right. yes. multiple yes. songs, but yes. I'm actually not really sure of that in the first place. 
I'm sure I wish you didn't put me on the spot with that because I'm sure there are better stories that I could think of, but that's the first one that just popped up in my head. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't want to. Oh, uh, no, damn it. Here's a good one. <laughs> Here's a good one. Uh, um, so we're, uh, I brought mushrooms to London one time, which was, uh, that's a thing. Um, and then my friend, mushrooms were legal in England for, as you probably know, for like this little short window, because it's like, yes. you can't make anything illegal that would be growing naturally. So the first thing my friend says to me when he gets me at the airport is, hey, dude, mushrooms are legal here. We're going to take a trip. So we did. We went to go see Lord of the Rings, uh, the three, whatever the third one was. That was, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, man, that was an, that was a great that was a great thing. But so we're like, we take the mushrooms, we go and s- smoke a gigantic Smoke, smoke a gigantic joint and then we're like standing in line and all of a sudden it's like oh we timed this perfectly except now we're all we're like all starting to trip right now some of the people were, that were with us weren't so it was like here dude take my money buy me a ticket please please and then we're gonna go up the stairs and my friend and it's like it's just all now happening way too fast and my friend is not as experienced as some of us are. And he's going up the escalator, but the escalator's broken. So this has blown his fucking mind. And he's staring there and he's like pointing at the escalator, like, what's going on? The escalator isn't moving. And like, you know, there are families with us. Like there are people <laughs> behind us who are like trying to get up this escalator. And then they're, and so it's like, yeah, dude, they're just stairs now. They're just stairs. It's cool. They're just like, any. <laughs> They're just like any stair that you've ever walked up in your life. Keep going. Just keep going up the stairs. Find a seat in the theater and we'll be good. Don't worry. About it. <laughs> you know, I know people listen to this fall into two categories again. There's the people who have never tripped who are listening to this going, I don't get it. Yeah. People <laughs> like me who are just like, uh, last time I had an experience, like you remember trying to go to the toilet and it was like, an, it was like a 30 minute mission. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like, how do I know if I'm going to the toilet or not when my entire body feels like warm liquids flowing from it in all, every direction? Yeah, right? Like, how can I tell if that was urine? <laughs> <laughs> and I came back and my friends were looking at me like, he's back, you know, he's a hero, he's made it. You know, they're like, hug <laughs> Yeah, there's more I can say, but won't. So, um, yeah, I hope this has been um, educational and musical for anyone who's listening where do, where do people find out more andrew if they're they're curious about this kind of thing not that i could possibly um promote any illegal activities but um if someone were to be interested in the legal things you do in the netherlands where could they um find yeah. out about you we got a website at uh www.guidedtripping.com it's one word guided tripping uh, and we also have a, if you want to send us an email, you can do that at info at guided And uh, you can go on our website there, uh, you know, there's four of us right now or five of us, I think. So you can check us out, see who might be interesting to work with um, and just send us an email, get in touch. Is there anything I need to say legally to not be arrested at this point for releasing this podcast? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't looked into I hope it, not. I just realized. I think you're fine. It's me Actually, I'm more worried about. No, no, I think we're cool. We talked about Amsterdam and mushrooms were legal in the UK, so it's all yeah. fine. It's all fine. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. might Google it afterwards, actually. Okay, so, and this is a pleasure. Final word about the body before we wrap up. Final word about the body. Um, yeah. yeah. Everything is the body. And, and I think mushrooms, acid, MDMA, they really help to show you that. They let you relax into um into the loving experience of what it is that you are give yourself give give yourself an appreciation for um for your beautiful frail human resilient fleshy self beautiful thank you for joining us today yeah thanks for having me mark some ways to uh, get more to give back and to get more involved now so um the biggest request i have would be to share the podcast with your friends people that you think would really enjoy it um email it to them put it on your social media tell them about it old school um yeah really appreciate that equally if you want to support us financially you can go to patreon that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash embodiment podcast and give us a dollar an episode and i'd say they're well worth a dollar so um that's less 
less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitated.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites. There's comments on there. Um, the Facebook group tends to be where people discuss things. So if you go to uh, put in the Embodiment Podcast into Facebook, there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on. So, um, yeah, I will reply to things personally there. So um, also on EmbodiedFacilitator.com website, uh, there's all sorts of freebies there. There's videos, there's free ebooks, there's ebooks you can buy. And of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embodied Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embodied Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. Okay, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there. Oof, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Till next time, welcome home to the body.